Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Perfect. Yep. Well, we will. There's a few more people that are uh, are signing in right now, uh, but I think we'll probably go ahead and, and at least review uh, the agenda real quick and get started. Um, let's see. There's about 20 of us right now, so that's good. We'll get a few more, I'm sure. Uh, so I wanted to start off with uh, this picture of my world record Boone and Crockett spike that I got a couple of weeks ago. Um, if any of you are familiar with the show KSL Outdoors, you want to watch on October 29th, and you might be pleasantly surprised by what you see. Uh, you might see a familiar face on there. So watch that on the 29th. Um, as far as... The Rural Webinar, again, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, these are really great webinars and I appreciate you and hopefully we provide some good content. I think today we've got some really good presenters with some very good tools that we can all use in rural Utah uh, in, in many different aspects. And so I hope you will take these tools, uh, you'll connect with the presenters after the meeting uh, and we can actually uh, you know, use these tools to make a real difference out there in, in rural Utah. So. Uh, as you can see the agenda here, uh, we're going to start off with the Office of Energy Development and Shauna Kwan talking about CPACE, which is Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, it, it sounds pretty difficult, but it's, it's actually a really cool tool that I think we could get some good use of. Uh, after that, we'll go to Flint Timmons with the Rural Planning Group and talk about code enforcement for beautification of towns. And then we'll go to Kyle Slaughter, who's got an appropriate last name for uh, the picture that I just showed. Uh, he'll be talking about capital asset inventory um, and, and some of the tools that the Rural Planning Group comes up with. If you haven't seen the Rural Planning Group's website and their tools and their videos and different things that they have, you need to check that out. Um, it, it's definitely got some great things for everybody to use um, uh, in, in, your, in your jobs. So with that, uh, Shauna, are you, are you ready to go? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me get my uh, my screen over to you real quick. Perfect. And so it should be sending it your way right now. Okay, I think I got it. Can everybody see my opening slide? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, Jake, thank you, and the rest of everybody in the called in onto the webinar. Thank you all for letting me talk to you about CPACE. As Jake said, it stands for Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. So really quickly, I'm just going to kind of fly through these slides. Um, usually I can do it in about 20 minutes, so I'll try to stick to that time. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about CPACE, what it is, some of the benefits, how we've structured it in Utah, and how our office provides support to it and municipalities that work on CPACE a few additional resources, and a pathway forward. We've been getting a lot of good feedback from various CPAY stakeholders, and that's given us some really good ideas of maybe how, how we can kind of uh, modify a few things to make it even more effective. So what is CPACE? CPACE is a financing mechanism that is designed so that a building owner can have zero dollars down, 100% financing for a term of up to 30 years, and so it's available for commercial buildings, and it supports any type of project that falls into the category of energy efficiency, renewable energy, water conservation, battery storage, or EV charging infrastructure. So it's quite a broad array of projects. And like I said, it's $0 down, 100% financing for a term of up to 30 years or the expected life of the improvement. Because of the way CPACE is currently structured, we generally recommend that projects should be in excess of $200,000 in value simply because it re relies on a bonding structure and the fees associated with that can increase the, the costs. So like I said, it's CPACE and the key there is the C. It stands for commercial, which means that any type of office building, rental space, industrial facility would be eligible, as well as any type of multifamily housing. So any units with more than four rental units are also eligible for CPACE. Of course, it's not eligible for a single family detached home. Some of you may have heard of our pace or residential pace. Um, that's what would apply for a single family detached home. And we don't have that structure in Utah. 
So how does CPACE work? This is a really high level, uh, and I can, I'm happy to repeat myself if there's any questions. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit confusing. When I heard it the first time, it took me a couple times to really get it. Um, so this is a really high level review, and I can uh, talk in detail as needed. So the very first step, of course, is designing the project under that list of eligible projects. So whether it's an efficiency improvement or installing a solar array on top of a building, um, you would want to design a project in line with the eligible improvements under CPACE. The next step is identifying a capital provider, and that's a, a, finance, a financial institution. It can be a bank or a private lender, and they'll come into play at around step four. The third step is securing lender consent. So basically how CPACE works is it's treated like a property tax assessment. So, for example, a municipality, when they want to make an improvement to their sidewalks, um, they would issue an assessment for that project and place that around the municipality. So, similarly, CPACE is treated like a property tax assessment, which means that it's senior to any existing outstanding mortgages or liens on the property. So, it's crucial and it's by statute that we have to have that lender provide consent to the CPACE assessment. That can be a challenge and sometimes um, mortgage lenders don't like don't like the idea of it, but generally speaking, the positive benefits for the building owner outweigh the concerns, and we've managed to get lender consent on a project in CPACE, and we've managed to see quite a bit of work of CPACE projects nationwide. There's been about $3 billion worth of CPACE projects nationally that all included lender consent. So the next step is the municipality creates the assessment area and issues the bond. And this is kind of where it all comes together. So as CPACE is structured in Utah, the projects are actually processed at the local municipality level, so where the property is physically located. And in the event that it's the property is physically located in an unincorporated area, then it would be the county's, um, it would fall to the county to place the assessment. So what the, the municipality does, it could be a city or a county, they place a voluntary assessment around the physical pro the boundaries of the property. And that's voluntary, that's critical, it must be voluntary. The building owner consents to having the assessment placed around the property. And then right now the municipality issues a bond for the value of the project. And that bond can include any soft costs that were incurred over the course of developing the project because, again, we're trying to get to that zero dollar down 100 percent financing to really ease up on the capital costs for a building owner. So this municipality issues the bond and this is where that capital provider comes back into play. The capital provider purchases that bond and the sale from that bond is used to pay for the project. The building owner then repays that through their annual property taxes because CPACE is treated like a property tax assessment, or they can have a separate arrangement with that capital provider. Um, for example, a project we completed in Utah was done at Hunt Electric headquarters, and rather than repaying annually through their property taxes, they chose to repay directly to the capital provider. So the building owner can kind of pick which option works best for them. And like I said, it can be for a term of up to 30 years or the expected life of the improvement. So the idea is that you amortize the cost of the project over several years, far beyond what you would get for a standard construction loan, and that would really lower the cost to the building owner on an annual basis. So what are the benefits of CPACE? Well, the primary one is that we look for is economic. It's an economic tool in many respects because CPACE projects are designed in such a way so that the savings you've accrued from that improvement should exceed your annual payment. Remember, your payment could be a term of up to 30 years, so your repayments on an annual basis should be relatively low compared to the savings. And so that would increase your building owner's net operating income. That means they can be cash flow positive from day one. One, that means that the building stock is improved and there's wider economic benefits to that. Of course, there's also the efficiency benefit. One of the keys that our office seeks to, um, one of the, mis the mission our office seeks to meet is providing affordable and reliable energy to all Utahns. And as buildings use less energy, it's easier to meet that mandate, at, or excuse me, that mission. Um, because when buildings are using less energy, there's less demand against the grid, and that allows Utahns to all have access to reliable energy. 
And then finally, like I said, when you're making these energy improvements to buildings, that actually does it can increase your building value, and for the municipality, it can improve the overall building stock. Um, the Appraisal Institute is beginning to recognize how these improvements increase the value of buildings as are underwriters and lenders, and so we're really trying to capture that momentum and demonstrate the added value to buildings by making these types of improvements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Utah structure. I mentioned before that it's municipality-based. But in 2014, we convened a group of 75 stakeholders to talk about how do we want to perhaps um, develop a program around CPACE to make sure that it's successful. And so the, one of the findings from that group was developing sort of a statewide program or statewide um, entity to just help provide um, guidance. And we decided that for these three reasons, because it would be standardized. One of the challenges can be that it's a complicated process, um, and so from one municipality to the next, it can be a challenge for a developer or for a capital provider if each municipality kind of has their own process. So we wanted to provide materials to keep a very consistent process that municipalities can use at no cost to themselves. Of course, that would add to the level of streamlined element of the program because our office serves as a resource to support these municipalities as well as all the other CPA stakeholders. And ideally, that makes things a little bit more navigable because it is a complex process and it really takes a few times um, to go through the process to really understand how it works from one state to the next. So what does our office do? So we're the Governor's Office of Energy Development, or also OED. Um, and we call ourselves the program administrator of CPACE. And in that capacity, we provide three primary resources. So we provide information. Um, we have a number of fact sheets. We maintain a website at cpace.utah.gov. And that includes a ton of information about Utah's CPACE program, as well as some national information that we've found useful. Of course, we provide education and outreach, uh, like for example, this webinar. I've also gone around to uh, city council meetings. I've done one-on-one -on -one meetings. I've done webinars. I've done PowerPoint presentations. Um, I also have another uh, staffer that helps provide education on these fronts um, because it is so important. There's so many different stakeholders involved in CPACE. It's really critical to provide continuous education and outreach. And then finally, we provide technical assistance. I am and I will talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Technical assistance is available directly for municipalities who choose to opt in to the statewide program. And there's a bit of a, a sort of a nuance there, a distinction that's worth making, and that municipalities can go ahead and do any type of CPACE project they want today. Um, they don't have to opt into the statewide program under CPACE. Um, what, why we designed this statewide program was that that would give them access to resources and assistance that they might not have otherwise. And so we encourage them to opt in, but they're certainly not required to opt in. If they choose to opt in, though, our office can provide technical assistance, which I'll get into right now. So like I said, there's the municipality opt-in agreement, and it can be signed by the city council. Um, the mayor can sign it on behalf of the city council. We've also had a sustainability director sign it. Presently, Salt Lake City has signed it, and Provo City has approved the agreement. We're just waiting on a signed copy. Um, and we are talking with Park City. We've talked to a number of other municipalities as well. Um, and it's just sort of a slow education process to talk to them about CPACE and get them on board. The agreement can be signed um, before any CPACE projects are actually in the pipeline, and it can be canceled at any time by the municipality. So we really just want to make it as simple as possible for municipalities to opt in and have their um, commitment as low as possible, and it really engages all the resources that our office can bring to bear. So what do we support to municipalities? Well, one of the first pieces for this technical assistance is vetting projects. Um, we understand there's not a lot of staff uh, resources and time available to go in depth on these types of projects. And so we developed a pre-application that verifies the project meets the basic eligibility for CPACE. And then we've also developed a more robust application that requires all the information that we would then in turn package up 
put it in a nice big bow, and present that to the municipality. So it's a step that building owners and developers take with us to ensure that their projects really would be eligible under CPACE and they're viable under CPACE. Um, we really don't want municipalities to have to deal with projects that um, perhaps don't meet the statute or um, aren't quite within the scope of CPACE and then have to deal with all the review and um, the time commitment to look at those projects. We really only want to be bringing projects to municipalities that we think have a very good chance of success. The next thing that we maintain um, for municipalities that opt into the statewide program is called the Authorized Service Provider List. Under the statute, any municipality that does CPACE must maintain an Authorized Service Provider List. But if they opt into the statewide program, they can use the list that we already maintain. I get probably one to two applications a week. So um, there's definitely, contractors are very aware of the list and they're increasingly putting in applications ahead of projects so that they can be very proactive and be added to the list early. And so that list gets updated on a weekly basis um, and it's a really robust resource. The next step that we provide to municipalities is that placing the assessment and issuing the bond, that step that really involves the municipality. So what we've done is we've worked with Ballard Spar, a local legal advisor, to, to draft templates to actually place voluntary assessments and issue bonds so that municipalities don't have to draft these documents themselves. They can use them and edit them as they, as they need to in order to, to fulfill that step of placing a voluntary assessment and issuing a bond for the CPACE project. We also maintain a program guidelines book to cap and capture and capture uh, capture all of this process in a single document because we realize that there's a lot of material that we're going through and so we want to keep it all in one single place and that's easy to access. We also, like I said, maintain information and resources. So we have this two-page fact sheet that's available on our website at cpace.utah.gov, and that at a very high level highlights exactly how CPACE works. And finally, as I said, we maintain a website that keeps all this information on it. So you'll, on this website, you'll be able to see the applications, you'll be able to see the lists, you'll be able to see the templates, the program guidelines, et cetera. I've also found that some folks are interested in what other CPACE resources are out there because CPACE is not, it's, growing nationally, but it's technically not a national program. It's a program being implemented at the state and local level. Um, so there's certainly a benefit to that because we can design the program in a way that works best for Utah. Um, but we've also learned that it's beneficial from being able to talk to other states who are also implementing their programs, and we're learning a lot from them. And I'll, Pace Nation is a resource, it's a national nonprofit that's really come out of this momentum behind CPACE and our pace to develop information and resources and collaborative environments for all of these state programs to come together, compare notes, share lessons learned, and really learn more from each other. And they publish a robust amount of data as well as booklets and guidelines for different types of CPACE approaches. And I found their resources extremely helpful. So like I said, we are having, um, we're looking at the CPACE program. We're really excited about it, but we'd really like to see more take of the program. And so back in June, we convened an advisory committee, similar to the advisory group we con convened in 2014, and we asked them for feedback on how CPACE is or isn't working in Utah. In addition to that, we talked with a basically every major state that has a robust CPACE program and conducted interviews with all of them to understand how their program works, how it's structured, and perhaps some best practices that we might be able to bring to Utah. So what we're looking at is potentially doing some restructuring to our program to mirror the best practices that are happening in the rest of the nation. The very first step is the assignable liens. Going all the way back to that overview process, I talked about how municipalities place a voluntary assessment and then issue a bond for the value of the project. As we've talked with different municipalities about this structure, there's been a lot of concerns about bonding, whether it's um, 
just sort of the word itself. There can be some bad experiences with bonds in the past. These are considered assessment bonds. They're not considered GO bonds. So they are different, but um, it can be really hard to overcome that initial concern when you say the word bonding. Uh, this type of assessment bond should not affect the municipality's bonding rating, and it should not affect the municipality's bonding capacity, but we understand that there are some concerns about liability and risk. And so what many states have decided to do is shift towards what's called an assignable lien structure. Utah sits in about um, a ranking of one of 19 states that have really actually enabled legislation and have some type of program on the books. So Utah is one of 19. However, Utah is one of two that actually still uses bonding. Everyone else has shifted to an assignable lien structure. And the idea is that the municipality can place a lien against the property voluntarily, of course, because this is entirely a voluntary program, and then assign that lien to the capital provider. So rather than doing bonding, they can do assignable liens, and the capital provider uses that assignment to then do a private financing agreement with the building owner. It's a cleaner structure. Um, we're, we don't deal with the concerns surrounding bonding. And the nice thing, too, is it's significantly less expensive. Um, I've been talking a lot with Zions Bank, and they made a fair point. The, the fees associated with bonding are not necessarily high, but that's simply the cost of doing business for a bond. But given that CPA's projects tend to be on the smaller side, that $200,000 to $300,000, the fees associated with bonding can be extraordinarily high given the, the actual value of the project. So as a percentage of the project value, bonding fees are high. But if you move to an assignable lien structure, you don't have that uh, several thousand dollar fee on the front end. Um, it's much lower. So that would also incentivize building owners and developers and capital providers to use CPACE more frequently. And finally, the other restructuring that we're looking at, and we're still working on this specific terminology. We're really open to any feedback that we get from everybody. Is some type of larger district that can process these CPACE projects. That's another concern that we've heard from municipalities is that they have limited time, they have limited resources, and they may not have the staff to vet projects thoroughly for example, having an engineer on staff to look at the technical specs of a project. And so a lot of states have moved to a larger district structure where the CPACE projects are processed by the district so that it doesn't fall on the city council meeting or the mayor or the um, energy department or the sustainability department or the economic development office to actually look through and process these projects. So like I said, we are still exploring this restructuring and we're really looking for robust feedback. Um, and so that's it for me. I really appreciate the time. Um, and Jake, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. So let's, uh, I, I know that we have a couple of questions on the chat line. Um, mm -hmm. One is from Linda. She. Uh, it, it kind of goes back to that bonding issue of how uh, counties and cities can be averse to bonding, and so she wanted to know if they can participate now without using a bonding structure. So as it currently is structured, they have to go through bonding. So that's, again, a, a, as Linda points out, that it's, a lot of counties are averse to it. So that's why we really want to move away from bonding. But right now, we would have to go through a bonding structure. Shauna, I have one other question. Um, after you kind of went through the last slide or two, um, what about what about using association of governments? Do you think they would ever want to handle a program like this? And yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, just if have you explored that idea already, or is that just something that's kind of on the table? Yeah, that's certainly on the table. We're trying to figure out what this district would look like and how it can be. Um, it has the necessary and adequate. Um, representation from the municipalities. We're trying to hit a balance between developing this district so that it actually alleviates the burden on municipalities, but not design it in such a way where there's still, you know, monthly meeting requirements and they, they have to call in and they have to, you know, vote on various items. So I, I certainly think, and that's been something we've discussed, I think we just have to figure out what the openness the AOGs are, have towards this type of uh, responsibility. So if, if you'd be willing to make an introduction, I'd really appreciate it. They do hold quarterly leadership meetings, I believe. It might be good to talk to the chair and see if you could get on their agenda. 
Um, but they, they do usually like to, um, when they handle grants or different things for people, they, they need some administrative um, compensation. Mm -hmm. But if you could think that one through, I think they'd be willing to listen. So I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Sounds great. Thank you, Linda. Uh-huh. Uh, we've got a question from Jeff Hadfield. Can this be used for solar farms or just commercial buildings? So if the, the farm is within the same property boundary as the commercial property, you would be good to go there. Um, the challenge is that if the farm is off-site in terms of the actual property boundary, if that's off-site, then it would not be eligible. But um, I'd certainly be happy to talk to you about any types of um, PPAs. That we also manage the Renewable Energy Tax Credit Program, um, and for commercial entities, there is a refundable tax credit available for solar installations. We have a, a question from Justin Fisher, and Justin, I'm not quite sure I understand it. He, he's talking about smaller co-ops um, like Garcane Energy. Um, is there any difference in, in working with Garcane Energy than, uh, say, a Rocky Mountain Power? No, there's not. Um, that's kind of a nice feature of the CPACE program, but we have noticed that there are, um, just given that certain municipalities don't fall into the Rocky Mountain Power Service territory, they've expressed, um, well, let me, let me just explain what I'm, let me do a better job of explaining what I'm about to say. So Provo City, as I said, they have approved the municipality agreement, but given that they're still in a net metering agreement conversation with their local power provider, their preference has been we don't want to do any type of renewable energy projects until we've sorted out our decisions surrounding net metering. And so they've opted into the program, and but giving me that feedback allows me to kind of target the projects in Provo City to make sure that we're not bringing projects to them that they would not be comfortable approving. So it wouldn't really be affected by a municipality outside the Rocky Mountain Power Service territory unless they're in some type of situation like Provo where they're restrictive on the types of projects they're willing to deal with right now until they have certain structures in place. Uh, we have a question from a Mr. Mike McCandless, the legend from Emory County. He says, if the state moves to an assignable lien, how would the finance company be protected? Would the lien still be considered a super prime lien as it is with an assessment bond area bond? So how is the Short answer is yes. Yes? Yeah. So the assignable lien operates exactly the same. We still maintain the voluntary assessment against the property, but rather than a municipality issuing the bond, they issue a lien and assign it to the capital provider. But that assessment still takes um, the property tax assessment position, so that, that first position. And so you would still need lender consent as well. Uh, Zachariah Levine from uh, Grand County says, do you have any idea what the costs are to hire a third party to administer this assessment bond over its lifetime? We had one developer interested in utilizing CPACE, but there were concerns about internal staffing capacity as well as the perceived level of risk to the county. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, that's what a lot of other states are um, implementing as a third-party administrator structure, simply because of that concern that they don't really have staffing capacity to deal with CPACE. And so what we looked at other states, there's a variety, a very big array um, in terms of fees. The way that most third-party administrators work for CPACE is they charge fees against the project value, and that's how they recoup their costs for services. And so we've seen the fees range anywhere from 1% of the project value up to 5% of the project value, but in those higher-end cases, they'll have the fees capped at a certain dollar amount. So for example, I think it's Colorado. I apologize, I don't have the number exactly right in front of me. I think Colorado's policy is that the project fee can be up to 2% of the project value, but capped at $70,000. So if you're really talking about those large-scale $10 million projects, which um, I believe California just uh, did the, the biggest CPACE project nationally, which was $10 million, there would be a cap at that um, fee. So that's usually how the, the structure works, and it actually is even more beneficial for government entities and municipalities because then, of course, the cost for this administrator is not coming out of their pocket. It's being charged against the projects. So we would be interested in doing that type of structure and perhaps see how, um, going back to Linda's comment, how that might fit in with the AOGs um, if they're interested in working with us on administering. Excellent. Uh, one last question, then we'll move on. This one is, is, is somewhat related. It's more related to energy efficiency. 
uh, coming from Mitch up in, in Box Elder and also Justin in Mitch. Caulfield. Um, mm -hmm. They have large manufacturing companies that uh, have solar arrays and are, are using energy efficiency products, but uh, their bill hasn't gone down because they're of their peak usage. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power, Power obviously charges at peak usage rate and not your actual amount. Um, any mm -hmm. suggestions for companies like that? Battery storage. So one of the tricks with um, shaving peak demand, that's kind of the, the key catchphrase, right? Uh, shaving peak demand is using the your pre-existing solar arrays and hooking them up to a battery so that the battery stores power that can then be released during those peak demand um, points during the day. So then that way, even though the actual um, but there is that peak demand during the, you know, whatever the, the timing range is, you can use the battery as the actual power source so then you're not consuming the energy off the grid and then you're not getting hit with that peak charge. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it, and Justin says in his, in his case, mm -hmm. peak demand lasts less than one second. Um, and I think yeah, I, um, a lot of times that's when sorry, the company ahead. shows up to work and they turn on all their machines at once, correct? It kind of gets that peak demand up, and Justin says, no, I'm way off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I completely understand that. There's a few different ways to set up the controls on battery storage, and it's, I'm not... Oh, we lost Shauna there. Actually, oh. you know... It might not be all the way down to a second yet, but the response time on battery when it does sense changes in consumption actually is getting increasingly better. I don't know if it's at one second just yet, um, but it it's worth exploring to see what your options are with battery storage. And I would I would also I can, suggest, uh, yeah. and I know Justin's in the Garcane service area, but Rocky Mountain Power has energy efficiency audits uh, that they'll offer to businesses, which are, are great. And then MEP, Manufacturers Extension Partnership, used to have a program called Waste Management, uh, which helped companies with water, air, solid waste, toxic waste, and energy waste, and helped them be as, as efficient as possible. So MEP.org is also a good place to, to look for that. And any other thoughts, Shauna? No, I think that's a great point, um, bringing in some additional experts. I was going to say that um, Hunt Electric, as I mentioned, they did the, um, the first CPACE project um, in the state. They, ha excuse me, <clears throat> they have a solar array tied to a battery storage solution. So they might be, you know, I can't endorse anybody, but given that they've, they have that existing project, they've actually estimated they're saving, gonna, they will save about $300,000 over the life of their project. Um, they, they're also a great resource to talk to. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Shauna. And if anybody has any uh, questions, her contact information is right there. This is great information um, and, and uh, any support and help we can get her on any proposed changes that come about with the program would be excellent. So thank you. So next, thank let's you, move on uh, to Rural Planning Group. Um, I'm going to switch over here and change the presentation. I, I have to change it to Jordan Clark. Um, so uh, Flint and Kyle, when that pops up, let me know. Perfect. There we go. So we've got Flint Timmons with the Rural Planning Group, and then right after him, we'll just go straight into Kyle Slaughter, uh, and they're going to talk about uh, code enforcement and also capital asset inventory. So uh, appreciate you guys joining us, and go ahead. The time is yours. So are you guys looking at a picture of our website or a picture of my daughter? I've got multiple screens. Uh, website. We've got your website. All right, good. <laughs> That's good to know. It's a good picture, though. Maybe Kyle will share it later. It's a cute one of his daughter. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Flint Timmons, and I'm with the state's rural planning group. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we're housed in the state's Department of Workforce Services in the Division of Housing and Community Development. And our main goal or mission is to help rural communities be prepared self-determined and self-reliant. Um, and so today we're going to talk about a couple of the tools that we've developed and the guides that we've developed for rural communities to help um, become those things. Um, I'm going to talk about code enforcement and then Kyle a little bit later will talk about capital asset inventories. Um, so here, um, if you guys, we're going to be basing our presentations off a couple of um, guides that we've put together and those are available on our website which you see. That's ruralplanning.org. Um, they're in our toolbox, which is this link here. 
And in addition to the two guides that we'll be discussing today, this toolbox has a lot of great resources for rural communities. Um, so we encourage you to look at that a bit more in depth if you like what you see today. Um, so we put together this guide called Code Enforcement Recommendations for Small Towns because we saw that a lot of towns don't have a good concept of code enforcement or its importance to their community. Um, so we're going to discuss that today, especially as it relates to economic development and the business atmosphere within a community. So just real quickly, we're going to discuss what is a code. Um, roughly, codes are the parameters or the laws of, regarding what may or may not be done in your city and how it may be done. So it not only looks at the end result, but it also looks at the process. Um, some common examples of code um, within a town may be restrictions on the types of signs that can be put up along Main Street, um, zoning, so what can be what types of businesses or facilities may be constructed in certain areas of the city, building safety, um, and solid waste. So are there properties that perhaps have you know a lot of derelict cars or you know scrap metal in the middle of town? Those are the kind of things that code can help address and um, work on. So how does code enforcement benefit your community? So we're going to talk about a couple of the benefits, and there's more listed here on the page. But to begin with, code enforcement helps your community be well organized, and it can maintain the community's appeal. Um, so that will, in turn, attract tourism, that can attract new housing, and that can attract business development within your community. Secondly, it can create a fair playing field for businesses. Um, by enforcing code uniformly, that means that nobody is having an unfair advantage over other people. So if I'm building my business and a rival builds a similar business, but he doesn't follow any of the codes that I've followed, you know, he sort of has an unfair advantage and may benefit from that when the town really should be enforcing these codes across everyone to ensure you know, uniformity, to ensure safety, and to ensure a fair process for everyone. Uh, next, it can help encourage uh, trust and confidence on the part of business owners and entrepreneurs in the community. It really helps for people who are taking a chance on your town if they can trust um, in the town leadership and town government. So if I come in looking to develop a piece of land, it really helps if I know that the town is going to enforce its laws, and that goes back to creating that fair playing field. I know that I'm going to get a fair deal because I see that this community applies its laws to everyone and applies them consistently. And that the laws actually make sense. Yeah, and that the laws actually make sense, and that's a good thing that we're going to get into a little bit later. Uh, lastly, we just want to talk about it increases a sense of community and improves the quality of life in your community. Um, it is really important, especially if you're looking to bring people into town, that they feel that there is a community there that not only encourages employees who would want to live there, but encourages customers to shop local because they feel connected to their town, they feel connected to their area, and they're going to want to support local businesses. That's actually an issue that we've run into across several different towns is people don't really feel connected to their local services, and so they'll go to the larger regional centers to do all their shopping, even though those same services are provided locally in town. Um, so good code enforcement, um, especially as it relates to beautification and sort of sense of place, can really improve and promote that um, shop local mentality. So next, we're going to talk about some of the simple steps to code enforcement. Um, this is all part of a code enforcement strategy, and that starts with your general plan. Counties and cities, every municipality, need to have a general plan. Um, and this is sort of the legal basis for all your code and, in turn, your code enforcement. So, you know, begin, to begin with, communities need to look at their, co at their general plans and make sure that their town's vision and goals are accurately represented in that plan so that um, they know sort of what environment they want to foster within the community. Um, next, they need to ensure that you have a good code that is based on that general plan. So your code needs to further that vision outlined in the general plan. And you also need to make sure that that code is consistent and that it is relevant. Um, sometimes people will write, or towns will write codes, you know, years apart from each other, and they sort of contradict each other. And so if I'm looking to, you know, beautify the town or create a business and there's conflicting code standards, 
I don't really know what to do, and it's really discouraging if I'm looking to improve a community and contribute if I don't even know what my role is or what I need to be doing. So that's a really important step, is to review that code for consistency with your plan, your local zoning laws, and any state um, regulations. Um, make sure that it's clear and consistent um, across all the different areas of development. And if there are inconsistencies that exist, um, you know, we would encourage communities to rewrite those codes, make sure um, that they're still, you know, make to make sure if they need them and to rewrite them as necessary. Um, the next step is to create a code enforcement strategy. Um, lots of times we think of code enforcement as just we hire an officer who just goes and does his thing all day. Um, but we really, small, for a lot of communities, that's not always an option. And so they need to come up with a good enforcement plan and strategy for enforcement. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to enforce your code and to, um, to check up on everything. So it's important to create a plan that understands when you're going to enforce the code, what codes you're going to enforce, especially in smaller communities with limited resources, some codes may be more important than others and need to be addressed first. And when are you going to enforce code? Um, you know, you need to sort of have a policy of how long are we going to give people to come to compliance, you know, when are we going to give out different citations and that whole, you know, that whole framework that's put into, into the enforcement strategy. We found that it's really important to get community buy-in, especially at the small local level, because if people are going to have codes enforced upon them, they should have a say in how those codes are enforced. Um, so it's important to consider community input so that they can have a say on what strategies are going to be more, most effective in our own community. So we'll go ahead and end with what are some, a couple strategies for code enforcement. As I mentioned, um, a code enforcement officer is one of those strategies. It can be fairly effective, but it can also be costly um, to employ a full or part-time officer who goes and looks at code enforcement and can assess fines. Um, we found that sometimes it's beneficial to share a code enforcement officer across different communities. So if there are some neighboring towns that are having a similar issue, those towns may decide to band together and everyone contribute towards um, hiring a code enforcement officer to um, assess the different codes in each of their towns. Um, but there are some other ways that are also fairly simple and fairly painless. One that we really like is um, community incentive programs. Um, those can be in the form of, you know, sort of an award system or a short-term revolving loan fund that sort of incentivizes people to clean up their properties. It's easy for those communities or for those properties um, to come into compliance with the, with the community code if there's some sort of, you know, some sort of reward for them or some sort of convenient method for them to come into compliance. So some towns we've seen have, have promoted a community cleanup day um, and whatever property is, is most cleaned up or comes into code, you know, um, more completely, they get a reward at the end, you know, whether it's a gift card, whether it's a $50 gift certificate, or, you know, something of that nature. Um, other community cleanup days don't necessarily have to have a reward. It can just be everybody gets together and decides to clean up the town. You know, they're, um, they go along all the sidewalks on all the roads and clean up. They go to certain properties that have been identified beforehand um, and cleaned up. Um, similar to that, a really simple and effective way is just to approach um, properties that um, maybe aren't necessarily in code compliance and approach the owners. Um, if they're on site, talk to them directly. If they're, you know, sort of absentee landowners, to email them or send them letters to um, the, the owner's address and just let them know that they're not in compliance with code. That is a very frequent issue that we've seen is sometimes, you know, these owners don't know that they're not in, comp they're not in compliance with the code or if they're constructing, you know, through building permits, make sure they understand what the codes are so that they can be in compliance with those codes. Check in on them along the way to make sure that they know um, what the rules are and what the laws are. Um, another way, and this one is sort of unpopular but can be effective, is fines and tax increases. You know, this is sort of that police power of, of government sometimes to 
increased fines and increased taxes, property taxes, on some of these properties, especially vacant properties. Um, it can really take the wind out of a community to have like a really prime piece of land that just sits vacant or has a really um, you know, abandoned or derelict building sitting in the middle of town when that land could be put to better use for economic development. It is appropriate for towns, after they've gone through these steps, to coerce these um, owners to develop the land in some way, and that can be done through to incentivize them, as we've, as we've discussed, through increased property taxes or fines for not being in compliance with relevant code. So I think that's it today for code enforcement. Um, just, you know, the best, or going along with the enforcement plan and strategies, just make sure that your community has the capacity for whatever strategy you put into place. Um, it's dangerous to bite off more than you can chew, or than you can chew, because it sort of dilutes your power and dilutes what you can do. Um, we like to promote this sort of method of incrementalism. What is the next most effective step that we can take with our available resources? Um, some towns, they look around and they're not sure that they can change things, um, but we've seen good uh, results out of proper code enforcement and something that can have a positive influence on towns. Um, it may not change everything overnight, but good, sustained, consistent code enforcement can really turn a community around and promote um, all these benefits that we discussed earlier. Yeah. Um, so I'll take over from, from Flint at this point. So there's there's more information in here. Our strategy in, crea in uh, creating these documents is really to write them for the smallest of the small communities. Um, that's our intent is to try and help them. So they are written very basically and, and try to get at the most fundamental uh, parts of the issues. And as we talk about um, asset inventories, that will kind of come out because those can be very complicated and we kind of are just advocating that communities get some idea of where they're at with their, their infrastructure. Code enforcement's the same way. I just want to tack on to what um, Flint said and say that um, too often our communities have code that was adopted from another city. Like we're in a town the other day who adopted Provo's 1980 code and um, you know that I wish that that were an uncommon thing, but there's there's a lot of communities that have adopted codes that just simply uh, don't have any relevance for the type of community that they want to be. So we're really trying to help communities drive back to who they want to be as a community, um, stemming from their general plan and the issues that they're um, that they're most concerned about from that general plan. So feel free to peruse this. There's more ideas and there's some additional resources at the end. Uh, looking at code enforcement efforts that other communities across the country, especially in the Midwest and across the Rust Belt, um, are using to try and encourage redevelopment of land rather than letting it sit vacant or idle. So um, I'll come over to this. This is Capital Asset Inventory. This is also available in that same toolbox um, on our website. Um, we have kind of a landing page for it. And there's a few resources. There's a little video. The voice is horrible because it's mine, um, but it just explains kind of the purpose of the capital asset inventory tool and why we put this together. And, and I'll just give you the brief background. As we've gone around to communities, it's very apparent that most community leadership, uh, where there isn't some form of capacity, uh, have very little idea of what their next big expenses are going to be. They're kind of living from emergency to emergency. Um, and so our intent was to start helping these leadership feel confident in going out and getting the information they need to really prepare for the future in an effective way. And so there's four things here. There's the guidebook, which is what we're going to spend the majority of our time in. Um, and then we have a couple other things, including a tool, a survey form, and then uh, a link back to our other resources. So this is the guidebook. It's very similar in look and feel and all that to um, the code enforcement guidebook. And this, as I said, drives towards really a simple framework for assessing a community's capital assets. Um, it, this started with some research in uh, what the GFOA, the Go uh, Government Finance Officers Association, uh, recommends. They recommend that you collect 12 data points, basically, um, to keep track of each of your capital assets. We added a few to that. Um, because we felt that they were pertinent and would assist a community as they go about um, 
as they go about trying to keep track of and decide what's going, what they're going to work on next. Um, the, the tool kind of explains why you want to have an inventory. And this is one thing I wanted to highlight, and it's when this should be done. Um, I think that this is really important as it relates to um, economic development for a community. A lot of our communities, as we go into them and, and spend time with leadership, they're sitting idle. Not in the sense that they're not doing good things, but in the sense that they aren't really driving towards economic development or anything else. They're really just keeping the lights on, making sure that services are going well. Um, when leadership really gets going and they say, hey, we really want to see something happen in this community, they go and they talk to you guys, you know, county economic development directors and other people, and a lot of times they might not have the background information that they need. So this, this little survey here on the right-hand side of the page, do we need a capital asset inventory, is something that we want people to think through. And it's really just assessing, do you have basic information on your capital assets? And that's helpful for you as you go out and look at the types of industries that could come to town um, based on their current infrastructure and what it would take to get additional infrastructure that would allow different types of industries to come into the community. So it's really getting a, a, a good idea of where we're at so we know how to get where, we're, where we really want to be. Um, it goes through and explains the information that I'm trying to collect. That, those are these things. Um, again, these are all listed in that tool. And they're laid out very simply and intentionally simply um, because we don't want to scare leadership from not doing this. Again, we have the Lindells of the world in mind, you know, very small communities that have never done something like this before, um, that we're trying to get them on the same page with some of the um, assessment that their bigger counterparts have already done. And then it provides a guide on how to go about it and our recommendation for a timeline um, and kind of a rotating timeline that allows uh, leadership to keep this up to date without killing themselves because we know most of them are volunteers. Um, talk about breaking assets down and those sorts of things. And I, I, I think most of this probably isn't uber interesting to you guys as economic development directors. Um, I wanted to highlight that this exists because I think as we see more communities implemented, it will be helpful for you in knowing where they're at with their assets so that you're more familiar with the types of industry that, that are possible um, for the communities. We would love it if you would share this with communities as they start thinking about economic development because we think that this is a fundamental component of their, of their economic development plans. And then here at the end, it kind of, we provide some additional um, tools with useful life for the communities and some other things. And I just want to highlight this at the end. Um, at the community level and at the county level, and really just in life in general, we spend a lot of our time um, on things that really are not very urgent and not very important. Uh, if you guys are familiar with this Eisenhower time management model, we're really trying to drive at getting people to spend time on what's important and urgent. Uh, or sorry important and not urgent because we spend our time here watching YouTube videos and here um, dealing with crises and deadlines and, and problems. Um, so we really want to get people thinking in the long term about the, the opportunity to plan for what their community is going to be like. And if we spend our time jumping from crisis to crisis, you know, a water line here or a sewer line there, there's not ever going to be time to spend looking at the long term vision for the community. And so that's the intent of this, and we're happy to take any questions um, that you guys might have. Any questions for the group, for the rural planning group? Now, where I where I see this as an important tool is if, if those of you are familiar with the, the building blocks of economic development that I tout, uh, one of the key aspects of that is infrastructure development. And so, as Kyle mentioned, if we don't know what types of infrastructure we have or the capabilities or the uh, condition that those assets are in. It's really hard to be able to sell those to, uh, to companies that we're trying to recruit or to be able to use those to help current existing companies expand and grow. So the more that we know, the better we'll be able to get where we're trying to get, just like Kyle says. So I don't, I don't give my endorsement too often to many people. But I will definitely give my endorsement to all of the presenters today. Um, Shauna, in the short time that I've gotten to know her, she's impressed me. She's very intelligent and knows her stuff. So please use her. 
And then the Rural Planning Group stuff is is incredible. So I'm, I've always been impressed with what the Rural Planning Group comes up with. So please use them, uh, the Office of Energy and the Rural Planning Group, because they are great. Um, they are just great uh, tools that we need to use uh, in the state. So with that, um, if there's not any more questions, we'll take one last look at the uh, world record spike that I killed a couple of weeks ago and let you all be jealous of, of the delicious elk steaks and roasts that I'll be enjoying this winter. Um, our next webinar will be November 15th, and we'll get you more information on that. I will also send out an email here in the next day or so with a link to, uh, to this session that we'll record and put on YouTube so that you can all go back and look at it again. So if you have any questions, again, let me know. We appreciate all of you joining, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Hey, Jake, this is Sean. I have one hey, quick thing. Yep. Um, I just wanted to, maybe it's the Rural Planning Group, but our office provides no-cost no energy code training. I know it's not a life and safety code, but if they're interested, I'd be more than happy to connect them with the code official we use to do those trainings. That would be great. We'd appreciate that. Yeah, That's absolutely. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks.